What's the latest with high res audio next on Ask the Tech Guy? This is Twit. This episode of Ask the Tech Guy is brought to you by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Hello, everybody. Time once again to answer some questions in our mailbag. It's Ask the Tech Guy. I'm Leo Laporte, and I got this email from John in Allentown. Leo, I'm interested in high-res audio. I, I remember you doing a podcast with a well-known musician a few years ago who started the movement in high-res audio. Of course, it was Neil Young of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and, of course, his great solo career. He's a big fan of these higher-quality recordings. He goes on to write, Since then, I've had the chance of hearing the difference between high-res audio and standard audio through some of the streaming music services. I have a trial uh, subscription with Tidal, and I've had a subscription to Google Play Music for many years. I'm impressed by the quality of Tidal's master quality albums. I feel like I'm in the recording studio. I purchased an inexpensive music player and have experimented with downloading FLAC files from the Internet, though the process of converting these files to one compatible with Apple iTunes remains a cumbersome process and confusing. Also, adding metadata to the player with, player with song titles, album name, and artwork still evades me. Please cover this topic. It's a huge interest of mine and the one that hasn't been covered in a long time. Yeah, it was Neil Young. He came on Triangulation some years ago. He, he was such a fan of high-quality music, he created this. This is the Pono player, a portable music player, digital music player that has very high-quality electronics, but also the capability of playing back high-res music. Let me tell... You, what high-res music is first. When you're listening to an MP3 uh, or an AAC file that comes from Apple iTunes, you're listening to music that's compressed, so it takes up a smaller space in the hard drive. And it's compressed using a kind of compression we call lossy. That is, bits of the music are actually removed to make it smaller. The theory behind MP3 and later AAC, lossy compression, is there are certain frequencies your ear won't hear if a, if a related frequency is playing. So the theory is if you hear a particular frequency, you can remove all of those related frequencies, just take them out of the music because your ears aren't going to hear it anyway. With, without talking too much about the validity of that, I think it's pretty clear to anybody who's listened to MP3s that while the quality is good, it's not quite as good as either uncompressed music or music compressed using a lossless technique. So that's the first issue, is the quality of the compression. And when you listen to a CD, you're listening to uncompressed music. Now, it is digital music. It's not compressed, but it is digitized. That means the waveforms that float through the air in regular music are sliced. They're sampled. That's the term that we use uh, at a very high rate of speed. And that sampled music is then turns into ones and zeros, which can be put on a Pono player or an, an iPod or an iPhone or on a CD or DVD. That digitized music may or may not be compressed further, but even if it's uncompressed, it's not exactly the same as the smooth waveform that the music makes in the air. It's just that, you know, this is the only way we can store it on a computer medium. So when we're talking about high-res music, we're really talking about how high quality the sampling is, completely independent of the compression. So a CD is sampled at 44,100 samples per second. Each sample is 16 bits of resolution. So that means it can be any number from 0 to 65,000 or thereabouts. So each 44,000th of a second, we, we, we generate a number based on the waveform, and that number is turned into ones and zeros, and that's the sample. If you sampled it at a higher rate, say instead of 44,100 times a second, 96,000 times a second, or you sampled it with a higher resolution instead of 16 bits, maybe 24 bits, that's called higher res music. In fact, many recording artists record at a higher resolution than the actual CD that they distribute. Uh, very commonly, you'll see uh, music sampled at 96 
kilohertz, 96,000 times per second, and 24-bit. The problem is those files get very, very big. They have to have professional digital recorders to do it, and they use up a lot of hard drive as they record. I asked Joe Walsh once what he recorded at. He says, no, those files are too big. I do, uh, I do um, 44 one, 44,100 samples a second, but I do it at 24 bits. So it's not quite as big, not as many, you know, same number of samples as a CD, but maybe a little bit higher resolution recording to keep the file sizes down. He thinks it doesn't make that much difference. And I think there are a lot of people who think it doesn't make a lot of difference. In fact, there are a lot of people who think Neil Young and his Pono player are, are snake oil, that you can't really hear the difference. It all comes down to something called the Nyquist theorem, which says how much information you need to record to record a certain quality of music. And essentially, uh, the Nyquist theorem says high-res music is going to produce music that is inaudibly better. It's, it's yes, got more information, but your ear can't tell the difference. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that's that, that that's the case. I, for a long time, did buy high-res music. I think the best thing you can do is buy uncompressed music. And if you, if you can buy it at a slightly higher sample rate, or ideally the original sample rate of digital recordings, yeah, that's going to be the full quality. That's going to be every bit of the sound that was recorded in the recording studio. I should warn you, though, a lot of high-res music is resampled analog recordings, tape recordings. And those, there's no point in making those high-res because that information isn't on the tape. So there's beautiful uh, recordings. For instance, um, Miles Davis' classic jazz uh, album, Kind of Blue, that was recorded on reel-to-reel -reel tape. You can't really make a high-quality, high-resolution digital version of that. The information is just not on the tape. But you can do a few things to get the maximum quality off of that tape. Or, or the Beatles, all of their recordings were also analog. There's only so much you can do with those. Probably the most important thing you can do is not compress your music too much. Remember, when you compress music in iTunes or you compress it with an MP3 uh, compressor, you can choose how many bits per second. Very common, uh, m most music is compressed from that 44-1 16-bit CD to 128 kilobits per second. So when you record, typically on an MP3, you're recording at 128,000 bits per second. 64,000 for the left channel, 64,000 for the right channel. That gives you a pretty good result, but you are chopping out more of that music. If you can get to 256 kilobits, twice as good. The music, I think you're going to hear fewer glitches and artifacts. It's going to be truer to the original source. Same thing with AAC. AAC is a more modern codec, so it does a better job at 128 kilobits. Apple stores its music when you buy music on iTunes, for instance, at 256 kilobit AAC. That's pretty good quality. But Apple has its own lossless codec, the Apple lossless codec. There's a comparable open source version of that, FLAC. If you can take a CD and, and digitize it using FLAC or Apple lossless, then you'll have the same exact quality that the CD delivered. You're not giving up anything. You're not compressing it. You're not taking any data out. And I think that's the best way to store your CDs. The good news is hard drive storage has gotten cheaper. The storage on your phone has gotten is expanded and, and less expensive. So you don't need to be as heavily compressed. That's probably the most important thing. So that's what, in my opinion, the current kind of thinking is that a lot of these super high-res recordings, many of them were kind of snake oil because they were made of analog recordings. If you've got a digital recording, if you can buy it at the original recording rate of the master, yeah, why not? That's going to be better quality. Usually they cost more. There are a number of places you can go online uh, to buy that kind of uh, music. Uh, my favorite place to go is, um, is a place called AIX Records. Uh, but you're not going to find many of your favorite music uh, there because this AIX does most of their own recording. That's how they make sure that you're getting a high-res version of the music that's as good as the original. But they do offer folk and jazz and uh, classical and country and blues and pop. So they have a variety of music there. AIX uh, is, I think, probably the best place um, to get high-res music. At least you know you're getting what you pay for. It's AIXrecords.com. Uh, in general, though, uh, I, I would say just don't com over compress your music. Listen on good headphones. One of the things the Pono player does do very well has a very good headphone amplifier in it and a very good digital to analog converter. That may be more important, frankly, than anything we've talked about. The the thing that converts it to analog 
and then the headphone amplifier that puts it into your ears. That, that makes a big difference in the quality of music. So that's a long way around of saying, don't worry so much about high res. Just worry about music you love and compressing it as little as possible. Great question, though. I'm glad we could talk a little bit about this because times have changed. And my thinking, frankly, has changed a little bit on this. I appreciate it, uh, John. Our show brought to you by LastPass. As always, just remember your master password, LastPass, remembers the rest. They now offer new features with their business lineup, LastPass Enterprise. That includes single sign-on technology. Already 1,200-plus pre-integrated apps. And then there's LastPass Multi-Factor, MFA, that goes beyond standard two-factor authentication by using biometrics and things like your geolocation. LastPass Identity combines the two. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. lastpass.com slash twit. Stomped on a nasty tech conundrum? Email askthetechguy at twit.tv.